Alright, so our topic for this week, by popular demand, or at least by popular dis- demand not to do the other topic that was, uh, that was quoted, um, is Parshas Amor, and, and the topic I wanted to talk about is one that bothers me all the time, and, and has bothered me for years. Uh, and actually, my Beit Midrash in, in our weekly Toronto Torah has addressed this at least four or five times in Parsha Articles 4, this week's Parsha for, for Emor, because it's a type of, quest, of question which you have to think carefully about. It's not, um, it's not straightforward, and it creates one of the big moral ethical issues of the Torah. Before we actually go further, just to note, we're learning the Nishmas uh, Shlomo Yehuda ben Moshe and Liba Bas Asher Anshel. So, if you take a look at the first source on the uh, on the sheet, it's from the parsha. Daber la Haron le more. Oh, we need more. No, I've got more. Daber la Haron le more. Ish mi zara chala darosam asher yevo mum lo yikrav la kriv lechem elokav. Tell Aharon your descendants, the Kohanim. If they have a blemish, they are not allowed to come forward to bring the literally bread of his God. It means to bring a carbon. Remember that lechem in Tanakh often does not mean bread at all. It simply means food. So, in this case, what it means is lechem elokav, carbon. Kichol ish asher bomum lo yikrav. Because anybody who has a blemish, again, lo yikrav, I'm going to translate again as to come close, but we're going to see it retranslated in a little bit. Ish iver o o charum o sarua. Whether one is blind, lame, and then it goes on to list quite a few different uh, defects, physical blemishes, and to say that the Kohen who has these is disqualified. Generally speaking, what we are referring to are blemishes that are visible, something that a person could identify by seeing it, and it's things that mark the person as different from the way that other people look. There is some discussion about a mum which is not visible, but you will notice as you interact with somebody. So, for example, if someone is mute, does that count as a, uh, as a mum? But that's, that's a little bit of field of where we're going. The idea that a Kohen cannot serve if the Kohen has a visible mum um, is one that we find, not within Judaism, we find it within ancient Near East in general. Societies had rules like this. I brought you from the book, The Origins of, well, the book is Disabled Body. The article within it is The Origins of the Disabled Body. If you take a look at number two, a disability, cultic impurity, or even a blemish might bar a person from entering the sacred precincts of the temple. Babylonian texts record a number of physical conditions that disqualify a man from serving as a diviner or priest. A late version of the tradition requires the Baru priest be of a particular familial descent. Sounds familiar. And flawless in body and limbs, the diviner may not have squinting eyes, chipped teeth, a cut-off finger, and so on. So, the idea that um, if someone has a blemish, they can't serve has to have some kind of logic to it that human beings are going to recognize such that it's not just Jews who, who who have this, but but other religions as well. At the same time, it's offensive. Why is it important? What do you mean? So what? So someone's missing a finger, so they can't serve. So right. Not only that. I mean, you know, Dasi asks the question in a relatively neutral way. Why do we care that someone has a blemish? But ask the question even stronger. It's not nice. Right. I mean, this is what the person needs, right? They're, they're struggling through life, or uh, maybe I'm making them too pathetic, but they, they, right. you know, they grew up being made fun of by their friends, mm-hmm. right? They, you know, now they, they come to the base, they just, they just turned 13, 14, whatever it is, and they're all excited. Their friend, Kohanim, who they hang out with, because Kohanim do hang out together. They live in the same areas. They are worried about laws of purity and impurity, and therefore they are together. They are the only ones eating truma, so they, they're all going to socialize with each other. All their siblings first cousins, whatever, they all serve, right? And then someone has to say to him, not when he turns 13, because the Kohen doesn't start serving in the base of Magdash at 13, it's a little bit later. No, sorry, you can't. Right, you, you know? think what? that this is the one place what where it doesn't matter. matter. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's supposed to be a spiritual place. Right. Yeah. What class is that? Almost like, like it's me. Yeah, right? Born to see both of them. Let's see, not physically... Something's not physically missing, but they're just not a cognitive Right, because a cognitive disability would not seem to be an issue. 
the um, assuming they can do the functions. Right. Okay. So it's a physical look. It's a physical look. Right. I mean, no, no, no. So this is, I mean, this is the problem. Nachama, you were going to say? Yes, the problem is after speaking to somebody, you mentioned it Right, but it generally will not be perceived, I think. I, I, I haven't seen that suggested on any of the lists or discussions of movement, that, that um, assuming that somebody is able to understand what they're told and know what they're supposed to do and execute it, I don't think cognitive issues would, would disqualify. That's my... That's my Instinct, based on what I've seen, also, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Also, depending on what you're going to say, the reason why it's so it would appear, yes. So, you know, this is this is a real challenge. I mean, we have enough challenges, and I think I sort of heard this discussion at that end of the room. The, um, we have enough challenges already in the fact that it's only a Kohen who's going to serve, and the fact that it's a male who's going to serve. Like, we're already limiting the population. But even those are different sorts of limitations. Yeah, it's different to be told, you're a regular Jew, you're not a Kohen, as opposed to, I am a Kohen, I'm part of it and everything else, and I know exactly why you're disqualifying me. You know, it's because I was born with nine fingers instead of ten. Right? I mean, and, you know, the, the moon that always gets a laugh out of people is a unibrow counts as a moon. The, um, yes. Sorry. So whether a male is allowed to tweeze it or not is an interesting halakhic question. But um, but it's actually where there's it's more unified. It isn't just that there's hair growing across, but like but that there's a depression such that it actually goes straight across. Yes, it can happen. It, yes, it does not need to be congenital at all, and we're going to talk about that. That's going to come into this. So sorry. Yeah, this is this is hard. So I don't know. There are two different types. Let me let me actually identify that here. It's important to note. We're not talking about the same thing as Birchas Kohanim disqualifications, where if a Kohen is going to attract people's gaze, get the, get people to look at them when they go for Birchas Kohanim, then there's a potential disqualification for that. That's separate from these. Laws of uh, of movement. I'm not sure. Left. Oh, yeah. My friend about Cohen is like her brother's a lefty and her father, and they make sure to like use their right hand always. And that's why they're like a really good good. Wow. wow. I mean, there are avodos. There are services in the base hamikdash that have to be done with the right hand. So in that sense, they need that. But take a look at number three, please. This is a classic pasuk, which really should set us up in opposition to the halacha we just stated. This is when Shmuel goes to coronate a son of Yishai, and Hashem doesn't tell him which son of Yishai it's going to be, and he looks at the first one to be presented, and his name is Eliav, and he says, oh, that's the one. Neged Hashem Mishicho, the anointed one is in front of God. And Hashem says to him, you got it wrong. Don't look at what he looks like. Don't look at how tall he is. I have rejected him. It's not based on what people see. People see with their eyes. Hashem looks at the person's heart. Even yeah, right. yeah, so, like, hello. They, why did you take it till Shmuel to see that? And then they even stop because people look at people look at their eyes at the Quan and have to look good. So we'll come back to that as one of four ideas, potentially. So hang on to that idea. But just to, to build the question, take a look at source number four. Gemara and Bava Metziah. This is a classic. The Torah says not to use one's strength against others, to abuse others. In other words, that is onaz devarim. That's verbal abuse. And they give you examples. And this is, this is a classic. You, you may have heard parts of this before. If someone had committed Averos but then did Shuva, so you shouldn't say to him, I remember when you used to do such and such. A person's parents converted to Judaism. They shouldn't say, well, you know, your parents did this and then they came to that. Even trying to do it in a positive way, not doing it in a negative way. Nonetheless, it can be hurtful. If somebody suffers a terrible experience, you, you have to be very careful how you speak to them. I, that's straightforward. And Onaz Devarim is not only about verbal abuse. It's not only about speaking. It's about doing anything that's going to cause somebody to feel 
bad. I forget if it's the Urayim or the Smag, one of the, one of the listers of the 613 mitzvahs, um, who says that glaring at somebody is on Azdevar. Can you imagine? Like, you have to be that careful about not making somebody feel bad, but we're just going to, you know, you know, take him out. Is there, I was actually wondering about this, but I didn't have time to look it up before, before um, the shear. But um, there is a halacha, sort of quasi halacha, I wouldn't call it firm halacha, that you shouldn't call someone up for an aliyah if the aliyah says things that could offend them. So, for example, you don't call up a mamzer for an aliyah that includes lo yavo mamzer v'kahal Hashem, that a mamzer is not allowed to, to marry non-mamzerim. The, uh, it's going to be very hard for that person to say, bracha, shabacha, banu, mikalim, and minas alman, who has Like, you know, he doesn't feel that when he, when he reads that. So, um, so I wanted to go back and take a look and see whether they mentioned a Balmum reading this section from the Torah. Would you call up you know, somebody who had a blemish to read all about how we disqualify them from working in the base Hamikdash? Would that be a form of Onaz Devarim? Um, we have all sorts of Sokim that support this, right? Shekhar Achim Vehevel Hayofi. You can bring example after example. Um, the Gemara in Tanis, I brought you one line from it. It's also a classic on this in source number five. The story about one of the Tanoim who is learning in base Medrash, and he has a really good day learning. He accomplished a lot, he's very excited, he feels very elevated, and he leaves the base Medrash, and, uh, and he um, encounters someone who is described in the Gemara as being particularly ugly. And, I don't know, he can't help himself or whatever, but he just exclaims, how ugly this person is. He makes that, he, he exclaims that. The, uh, and so the person, um, the, actually it's even, it's even stronger. He says, he says, Kamachar Oso Ish, Shema Kobane Yircha Machoarin Kamoscha. Are all the people in your city as ugly as you are? To which the fellow says, I don't know, go ask God. <laughs> you know, the, uh, go tell the Uman Shasani, go tell the craftsman who made me. The, um, and then he realizes, you know, that he has made a major mistake, and he goes trailing after him, apologizing, beseeching him, please forgive me, please forgive me. The guy doesn't want to forgive him. He ends up going back to the guy's city, and it's a whole story. But the, unquestionably, the message of the story is, is Hashem made this person this way. How can you degrade them for, for the way they look? Um, one of the Abrahim we had in our first couple of years, Russell Levy, um, wrote an article making the problem even stronger. He noted, if you take a look at source number six, also from our parsha, the Torah describes the Kohanim and it says, Kedoshim yihyu lelokehem, they shall be holy for Hashem, velo yechalalu shem elokehem, and they shall not desecrate the name of their God, ki es ishe Hashem lachem elokehem, hei makrivim v'hayu kodesh, because they bring the carbon to Hashem, therefore they have to be holy. What would be involved in desecrating? So if you look at number seven, Rashi says, the Pasuk is saying, Al Karcham Yagdishum based in Bekach, meaning based in has to force them to this. I mean, they, if they say, I don't want to keep to my rules, the based in is supposed to say to them, You have to. This is about any Kohen. But Rabbi Leo Mizrahi writes, in num- in, also in number seven, commenting on Rashi, that what it means is if a Kohen says, You know what, I'm interested in becoming Tame. I understand it'll disqualify me from working in the base of Mekdash while I'm Tameh, but I want to become Tameh. You know, a, a Kohen loses a, uh, a friend. A friend passes away. He says, I want to go. I want to go to the, uh, to the funeral. And they say to him, you're not allowed to. You bring Karbanos. And he says, so I'll be disqualified. For the next week, I won't be able to bring a Karban. But it's important to me to be able to go to the funeral. The halacha is, that's what we're being told here. He's not allowed. It's also for him to become Tameh. So if I... And, and the rule is... Because they bring carbonos, so I might have thought Russell wrote the, um, that uh, that if so, a Balmum who can't bring a carbon anyway would be allowed to become Tame. There's no fear of him ruining the the carbonos, but we have no such exclusion. He still is not allowed to become Tame. And if you take a look now, back in number six, at the second pasuk that I brought there, we find out, Kol Isha Sherbo Mum Mizera Arona Kohen, a Kohen who has a blemish, Lo Yigash Lakriv Es Yishay Hashem, is not allowed to bring the Karbanos, Mum Bo Es Lechem Elokav, Lo Yigash Lakriv, he has a Mum, he's not allowed to bring the Karban, but then it says, Lechem Elokav Mikoche HaKadoshim, Umen HaKadoshim Yochel, he does get to eat from Karbanos. So in other words, 
we're saying that he is eligible to have an association with Karbanos. He's eligible to eat the Karbanos. He has Kedusha. He didn't stop being a Kohen. He's not allowed to become Tame. So why are we keeping this one thing from him? To bring the Karban. He eats Karbanos. He's not allowed to become Tame. All the rules are going to pertain. Just that, we're not going to let him bring the Karban. So, four different ideas to try to explain this. It will not come as a surprise to tell you I like the fourth the most. The, um, but we'll, we'll go through all of them. They all have, have points in their favor. Well, it's not racist because it's not based on race. It's discriminatory. Yeah, no, it's absolutely discriminatory. You can't, I, I think to deny that, uh, I, I think, is very difficult. So the first approach is to say that it looks like we didn't care to present a high-quality Kohen to God. It lo- if, I, if, if the Kohen who I send up there to bring the carbon is somebody who appears deficient in some way, it looks like I didn't care enough to get somebody, somebody who would make it look good. In the same way, and I realize there are flaws in this comparison, but nonetheless, the, uh, in the same way that if I um, if I'm you know choosing a uh, you know what to wear when I'm going to dive into Hashem, if I am um, deciding what kind of sitter to use or whatever it is, I should use something that looks nice. The Kohen should also be somebody who looks nice, unless you say, "Wow, that's shallow." Take a look at Rashi in source number eight. Don't blame me. Anyone who has a defect shall not. Yikrav, and again, I'm not translating the word Yikrav, but I'll tell you it means to come close, but we're going to challenge that in a little bit. Eino din she Yikrav, it will be illegal for him to do it. Kimbal, like the Pasuk in Malachi, Malachi criticizes the Jews in the beginning of the second base Hamikdash for bringing karbanos that are of poor quality. And he says, You want to bring an animal that is defective? You want to bring an animal that's inferior? Try bringing that to your governor and see what your governor would do. Try bringing that as a gift to a human being and see whether it would be accepted or not. It looks like you're not really trying if you bring a, uh, a carbon like that. So it's an insult to God. But you can take yeah. your God to a king because a king could, you know, somebody can come up there with a limb and, and yeah, it would be like, this is what you said. And a delicate, I'm telling you that God is not... Right. I mean, all those Hasidic stories, right? About the guy who comes into shul and doesn't know how to daven, but he whistles or he says the letters of the alphabet. Right? We like those stories. Yeah, but who says? I thought, I thought it was it was Hashem who says that we that a person with a mum can't bring a carbon. It was. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's not just. No, it's not. It's, it's not, not a human not invention. To, if, I give, if someone who has a defect brings. A carbon, it doesn't look nice. Meaning, Hashem commanded us that we can't bring, we can't give right. a carbon of the earth. Right, but we're just trying to understand the inconsistency. Well, I know, but when you said before, um, the reason, the, like the first reason, is that because it doesn't look nice, it sounded like mm-hmm. we were saying it as a people, not right. No, it's, right. It, it, it would make more sense coming from a B'nai Israel perspective as opposed to God's perspective. If, if this were right. Although it would offend more, it would offend more then. Because yeah, now you'd have no justification. We, the problem here is yeah. Yeah, the problem know. here is that it's not it's not the Torah's rule versus modern morality. It's the Torah's rule against the Torah's rule. The Torah itself talks about not harming other people and not making people feel bad and not looking at appearances and so forth. So there's a, a twist on this which um, I think Reza Hanna had said before, and the Rambam does it. If you look at source number nine, I took the Freelander translation of Moradu Bucham just because it's available to cut and paste online. The, uh, he says, in order to raise the estimation of the temple, those who ministered therein received great honor, and the priests and Levim were therefore distinguished from the rest. It was commanded that the priest should be clothed properly with beautiful and good garments. A priest that had a blemish was not allowed to officiate. And not only those that had a blemish were excluded from the service, but also, according to the Talmudic interpretation of this precept, those that had an abnormal appearance. For the multitude does not estimate man by his true form, but by the perfection of his bodily limbs and the beauty of his garments, and the temple was to be held in great reverence by all. Because this is the way people are. When they look at 
the Kohen who's serving there, they will be influenced by what they see. And he says, similarly, the Levim don't bring Karbanos. They're not agents in the atonement of sin, so there's no issue of their appearance. The Levi wants to go sing and look however he looks. The duty of the Levites was the performance of vocal music. And a Levite became therefore disabled for service when he lost his voice. The object of the singing is to produce certain emotions. This object can only be attained by pleasing sounds and melodies accompanied by music, as was always the case in the temple. So it's like a human divorce human beings, basically? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's saying human beings are just biased by what they see. And as Hashem said to Shmuel, and therefore... It's true. It's true. Therefore, like, we're going to... Like, like, yeah, the, the worst qualities of man instead of trying to reform man. Well, that's one way to look at it. I guess the opposite, if you have, like, let's say you have the whole thing going on, and there's some guy, like, limping along. Everyone's going to be paying attention to the guy limping along yeah. as opposed to the actual You're saying service. it's a distraction. It could be. I'm just saying. The Sefer Achinoch looks at it more it towards a distraction a little bit. You don't want to yeah. look when you see something. Yeah. Bad. Right. Yes. And once so they fix it. There is. And you hold it all like dry up. And this would be a lesson to And that's what our religion is. Like, that's what turned into the eye of the LA. We let these people in, and they were doing the ultimate, like, yeah. Thing, yeah, then we would all of a sudden have a higher regard for him. Not know that. We wouldn't know that much. Right. Right. You had him away, and you certainly would. Look, the guy in the basement is limping, so my neighbor's limping. And Hashem doesn't have a problem with that. He's accepting him. Right. So that's the problem. Yeah. 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 That's the problem. I think that there is something to be said here because it points to a very interesting tension, which is the question of least common denominator religion. Meaning, on the one hand, we want it to appeal to everybody and be meaningful for everybody. And therefore, maybe I should say, people who aren't at a level yet where they will accept when they see somebody in there who has some problem, you know, for, we need to reach them also. Let's make it available to everybody. On the other hand, there is, no, this, this is supposed to elevate people. You're supposed to give people something to aim for, and even those who are not there yet should be told, this is the way we do things. And you know, if you're really going to make concessions on this, there are an awful lot of other things within the Torah that you should also right. make concessions right. for, where we don't, where we say, no, we're holding you to a higher standard. Mm-hmm. So if this, is a, this is a hard idea to accept. There was a big controversy about this, going back about five years, where Benny Lau published an article in which he suggested that maybe this could change in the time of Mashiach and a Beis Hamikdash. He argued that perhaps it could change. If anyone was going to say it, it was going to be him. The, um, his argument... I brought you, it, there was a back and forth. He published an article. Rivera and Lichtenstein published a response basically disagreeing with everything he said. And then Rabbi Benny Lau wrote a defense for himself. So I couldn't find Rabbi Lau's original article, but I did find his response to Rabbi Aaron, and that it tells you what his argument is. If you take a look at source number 10, and I gave you a link where you can find somebody scanned in the, uh, the latter two articles from the series. He says, As far as that line from Malachi, of bring it to your governor. So he says, Im kol kavod l'rav, with all due respect to Rabbi Lichtenstein, he says, He says, you can't disagree with the simple read of that Pasuk in Malachi. What do you mean? Sham v'aday mazbir achron hanevi'im, the last of the prophets, that's Malachi, explains, as Isra akrabas balei mume b'musagim shal normot chevratiyot. He said, he explained the disqualification of one who was blemished based on social norms. By saying, try to bring this to your governor, Omer, that tells me, if your ruler would actually accept the carbon happily, then it's not degrading to use it. So he argues that it's subjective. It's also not subjective. It's also not subjective. The mitzvah, you can't really say that it's can't change it. But he says it's, by definition, it's subjective. It's not that we're making it subjective. His argument is, the, the Torah's, hang on, the, his, the Torah's true mitzvah, as explained by Malachi, is 
don't bring something which your society would consider inferior. Yeah, but it's the same Malach, it's not explained by Hashem. Well, that's the, well, yeah, that's, that's a very dangerous statement. The, to say that Malachi is not a Navi Hashem is very dangerous. No, Malachi is quoting Hashem's words. He's a Navi. But when the, when the Mitzvah comes, the coin with the mom can't serve, Hashem doesn't finish the sentence with because... But there's so many things that the Torah are not explicitly... Right, that's so what we're going to keep them, exactly. No, no, but meaning that, like, there's a little bit of gray area in terms of interpreting what that means, right? And Malachi is sort of, like, clarifying. Clar- clar- right, clarify so that because we have a couple of things that we still have to get to, and you don't want to stop with number one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this forward. Ravarin's response, and this is what I keep coming back to with the word Yikrav, is to say you misread Rashi. When, when Rashi brought this Pasuk back in the, uh, the first side, in source number 8, Rashi was not trying to tell you that the definition of the rule regarding defects is your governor would reject this, therefore Hashem rejects it. That's not what Rashi was doing. Rashi was trying to explain the word Yikrav in the Pasuk, because that's what Rashi does. The Pasuk says, Ko isha shabum bomum lo Yikrav. If someone has a defect, he shall not yikrav. And there are two ways to explain the word yikrav. One is bring a carbon, like yakriv really, and the other is draw near, that there's a prohibition against him entering the base hamikdash. And Rashi is trying to tell you that, it's, that he's disqualified from bringing a carbon, because the Pasuk says, hakrivei hu secha. That's the disqualification. Yikrav means to bring a carbon, not that he can't enter the base hamikdash. But Aaron says, you misread Rashi. And the um, and he he argues that this whole idea is wrong. The halacha is what it is, and the title of his article gives it away. If you look at the heading in number eleven, the um, where the heading of Rav Aaron's response is halacha inena shivionit, which means basically halacha is not egalitarian. The uh, Rav Aaron says, "I'm sorry," and no one's more sensitive than than Rav Aaron Lefenstein to to issues like this. It's not that he doesn't care, the, um, but he says, "This isn't your out. This isn't your way around it. You're not going to be able to tell me that in the time of Mashiach somehow this rule changes. It may change in the time of Mashiach for a different reason, but I'm going to come back to that. We're not there yet. the The second approach is the mystical approach. And if you didn't like number one, whoa, are you not going to like number two? <laughs> the, um, this argument is found in works of Hasidus, but it's also found, found in, uh, in pre-Hasidic ideas, like in the Kliyakar. Take a look at number 12. And I was glad I didn't have a space to translate this, because then I would have had to burn all the source sheets afterwards. The, um, he says, Uma Shapirish Rashi, Enudinshi, Krab Kamar, Kabeonola Fechasech. He quotes you the Rashi who says that it's about bringing an inferior thing that your governor would reject. Enum of Rosh Bamikra. He says, as we've already observed, that's not in Sefer Vayikra. The Chumash didn't say that. Alkeno Miranis, you know what I say? Shakadmonim Shayu Bikin Bachmos Hayu Yodin Bachom Mumshin is Hava Ba Adam Terem Heyoso Mitzad Eza Avon Shara Ubo. He says, I know who the Hebrew readers are. The, um, <laughs> he says, way back but that was a great reaction. That was great. The um Way back, those who knew the sciences, those who knew true chachma, true wisdom, knew before it even happened that certain people were going to develop certain blemishes because of certain things that were wrong with them inside, certain sins they had on their record. Meaning, derech mashal, for example, im yadushu mekabel shochad, if they knew somebody accepts bribes, yadu bo shesofo bali de'ivaron, they knew that he would eventually become blind. And he goes on with other examples. Therefore, the Pasuk says, if one of your descendants will have a mum. You know him. You know that in the end he will have a blemish. You can tell from his deeds that he's going to have a blemish. In other words, what he's trying to tell you is... That if there's Hang on, you have to read the rest of the Kliyakar. He goes on to say, if you jump to the ellipsis on the next to last line, mm-hmm. this refers to someone who does not have a congenital 
defect. Shrey Masav Garmulo Mitzius Hamulam. Then, you know, we're talking here about someone whose deeds caused it. But I know Shamanu Nola Bimuma and Muma Akevolo. Based on what he has said so far, I wouldn't know what about, um, I wouldn't know what about if the person was born with a mom. He's still going to disqualify it. He's not going to say that it's actually, yeah, there's a separate reason to do this. But he says it's not this. It's not an indication that there's something inside. It's a technical disqualification. It's hard to, like, we don't know what they are as far as you want, like, uh, but you don't need it for this, for this point that he's well, making. Really obvious that he, thinks, like, he thinks that Hashem will zap a person in this world by giving them a, uh, a defect. Yeah. Very scary, no? Very. Yeah. Very. And how do we know? Yeah. We're not Kadmonim. The, um, the Kadmonim knew. I have no idea. The, um, but, yeah, wow. If you didn't like number one, Number two, I'm going to do it for you. Right. Well, it's not just that. It goes against it, it goes against a worldview that says, first of all, the Gemara says, "Schar mitzvah b'hayam aleka." Right. Reward and punishment are not necessarily carried out in this world. You can't see what happens to somebody and and diagnose. You know, this happened because of whatever. The um, it, it, it's. It also goes against, you know, what we think is the evidence of our eyes, meaning you see people who have physical defects that would disqualify them working the base Hamikdash, and they're wonderful tzaddikim. Like, what, what are you, what are you even talking what about? What saying is exactly right. what bothers all of us about the fact that the Torah doesn't let these people worship in, in base Hamikdash. It's basically he's saying, like, we think these people are evil, just like they look evil, so therefore, go yeah, away. that's exactly right. He's you don't like that either. They, um, that's exactly right. That's what he. What he's doing is he's saying to you, "I know you don't like this, but just the opposite. This is this is telling you that there's a reason. There's something wrong with them, and that's why they're and that's why they're disqualified." It goes back to the shear. You were there, I think. Jeremy was there. You were there also. I gave him a lava malka shear um, a couple of years ago on gene editing and CRISPR. They, Jeremy was there. So um, so we talked about there the issue of beauty in the Torah because. While it's all well and good for us to be very self-righteous when it comes to this and say, well, how can you judge someone based on how they appear? At the same time, when you read Chumash Gracious, all the people who are tzaddikim, all the people who are really righteous, are emphasized that they have wonderful appearances, right? Rachel, Yosef, they're all appealing people. There is some kind of association going on. For more about that, go back and, and listen to that year. The, um, it's, it's on YU Tower. But I want to progress to a third and fourth idea. So the third idea, I have to credit Rabbi Weintraub, who was the scan with my baby Drash, and he, in one of our articles on this topic, offered a suggestion. He quoted Rabbi Lau's argument. He quoted Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein's response. He says, My revered teacher, Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein, Shlita, has written sharply against Rabbi Lau's arguments. Certainly we are obligated to accept the Baal Mum as an equal and to create a world in which this is so. However, public opinion does not define what is considered whole or broken. By explicitly excluding the Balmum from service, the Torah sets an objective definition of broken. Rabbi Lichtenstein does not explain why this should be the definition. But perhaps we may suggest that the Beit HaMikdash serves as a window to a world which is entirely good. And he quotes you the Pasuk from Yeshaya. Regarding this world, it is said, The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame shall skip like a heart, the tongue of the mute shall sing. May we see this fulfilled soon. In other words, what he's saying is this. The Beis Hamikdash is supposed to represent Olam Haba. It's not supposed to be like the rest of this world. The Beis Hamikdash is supposed to be that world which we anticipate, and if you think back to the Midrash about Harsinai, about how people who had physical disabilities and defects of various kinds were all healed when they came to Harsinai, such that Moshe can say, all of your eyes saw it, all of your ears heard it, because in fact they were healed, so too Mashiach comes, there are none of these. None of these defects persist, and therefore the Beis Hamikdash, which is supposed to represent that world, is a world in which you walk in and everything looks perfect. So it's almost like instilling hope in people that yeah. like one day... But a moon that you can't see is okay in that case? Like that should also be healed in the time. Right, except that no one's going to perceive it when they go there. They won't, they won't recognize it. It's not going to disturb this vision. We're trying to create... Um, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. We're trying to create this kind of world in which it's just perfect. Everything you want is there. 
Just just some blood and smoke and right. you know, other stuff. But, so, so we're recognizing the pain of the person by saying. No, we're not recognizing. This is not about recognizing. This is a, this is a statement of yes, we don't want them working in the base hamikdash because the um, the it, it, the environment that we're trying to create is one in which people can envision what olam haba looks like. They're still gonna. I mean. Yes, it might give some element of hope as opposed to just pure pain because they're going to say, oh, that's great, then I'll be different. I don't like this feeling. Okay. The, um, what I like about it is that it gives an explanation that, number one, does not insult the person who, who has the, uh, the mum and doesn't, um, to use Hadassah's word, pander to the worst instincts of people. Why does it just insult the person? Saying that you're not in a vision of the fact that yeah, you can't can not. No, I think no, what I mean is that you're, you're suffering in some way, yeah. and one day Mashiach will come and you won't suffer anymore. Well, that's and great. Like that's the vision. Yeah, I mean, the debate here, the debate here in terms of what Rezal Khan is pointing out is actually, it's reminiscent of a debate that, um, that I've heard, um, and it's a very painful one, but the question is asked sometimes, and I want to be very careful about how I, how I work this. The, um, if there were a pill that somebody could take to get, that would let them get rid of a personal problem that they have, would they take that pill or would they say, this is who I am and it's actually part of my identity and it's made me better and so forth. You hear it sometimes um, from people who have, uh, who have children who are born with certain problems. The, um, and they'll say, no, this is actually, this is who they are and this is the personality and this is good and, and, and so on. And that's really the debate you're having here because what, what this third argument says is, yes, this is something that people would not want. And what we're saying to them is, one day you won't have it. And what we're trying to portray to people is what that world is like. But someone who says, I don't want you to take it away from me. This is who I am, and I'm good this way. Um, they're going to say, well, I don't, I, I don't want you to purify the world and, you know, by, by getting rid of my features. Right? as opposed to defects. The, um, but that's really what that debate is about. The, uh, but that's a, that's a third view, and I think it's an important idea. I think there's a lot of truth to it. Um, but then we get to the fourth, which, yes, is mine. The, um, and I think it's that we look at the Kohen the wrong way. This is not going to help the Kohen feel better. Let me make clear. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I think it, pre- it presents a logic that, to me, is compelling. The, um, first of all, recognize that we don't discount the value of someone who has a moon. And the best proof of it is Moshe. Right? Moshe is Kavad Peh. He cannot speak. And going back to what I mentioned earlier, there are those who do on their, in their discussions about what qualifies as a mum, they say that being unable to speak properly counts as a mum. Moshe himself can be a Baal mum. Now, technically, there's a Gemara in Sanhedrin, which we're going to sort of come across in a little bit, which may indicate that what Moshe had was not, strictly speaking, a mum, but it sure looks like it. There is a Gemara that can be read that way. I'll come back to it. The, um, the, the other side, the flip side of it, is that being without a physical defect does not make a person good in Chumash. Think about those Kohanim we just talked about who qualify to work in the Mishkan, who qualify to work in the Beis HaMikdash. Think about some of the examples and how we look at them. Right? Chafni and Pinchas would be you know, one example of people who are working in the, uh, the Beis Hamikta, in the Bulal Mishkan in Shiloh, right? And they're described as being awful and causing the destruction of the Mishkan in, uh, in Shiloh. You have Eviasar, the Kohen Gadol, who supported the coup of Adon Yahu. Um, you have the descendants of the Hashmonaim, who become corrupt and try to take the throne. The Tzdukim, the Sadducees, like... It's not as though not having a blemish somehow meant these were good people. And it's, going back to Moshe, it's not as though having a blemish made somebody bad. No, but it, you could take it the other way, that because they saw such an elevated position, it must have had ego. And... Yeah, but that, that argues for, and I'm going to bring a Gemara like that shortly, that argues for saying then don't count out the people who have a moon. Just the opposite, we want them to have a moon. The, um, the, our leaders benefited by, by having a moon. 
Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll jump to it now. Take sure. a look. Are you, are you, would a lip be considered a moon for the koan, though? Because that's in, like, you wouldn't right. necessarily see that. So that would Correct. Really so that's part of the question of whether Moshe's, you know, mo- whether Moshe's speech problem, lisp or stronger, qualifies as a moon or not. The, the Gemara that, that I've been alluding to, well, all right, let me, let's go through it, because mm-hmm. it's easiest to do this, just to do this in order. The, um, a judge on a base din is allowed to have a mum. If you're talking about our leaders being disqualified for, for, for a mum, a judge on a base din is allowed to have a mum. A judge on the Sanhedrin, though, is not allowed to have a mum. There's a Gemara in Sanhedrin, and this is the one I was alluding to, it's, Shabbos, it's Sanhedrin on the club, which says... Moshe is told the new judges you've appointed, the elders, the Zakanim, are going to stand there, imach, with you. And the Gemara says, like you, just like you are innocent of any spiritual defect, they have to be innocent of spiritual defect. And just like you don't have any physical mum, so too they don't have a physical mum. The, um, that's the basis for the Rambam in source number 14 where he says he says just like a based in has to be innocent in terms of righteousness so too they can't have any physical defect and on that the Lecha Mishnah comments the line right below it that's the high court the top based in he can't have a blemish so that makes it sound like Moshe did not have a moon the problem that I have is, as I've noted, you do find writers who say that speech defect does count as a mum. The answer may be as simple as what I said to you before, which is that everybody is cured at Harsinai. And therefore Moshe doesn't have it anymore. By the time you get to Harsinai, Moshe is now, is now without mum. That's not so strange. That actually fits really well with the fact of Sefer Tevarim. Right? There's this big irony when Moshe is first asked to lead the Jews, he says, Lo ish anochi. Right? I'm not a person of words. And then, in the beauty of Sefer Devarim, Ela Devarim, same word that he used, Asher Diber Moshe. These are the Devarim that Moshe spoke. And suddenly he can speak, and he gives a month-long speech. You know, standing at, at Abraham Yardin, and all of Sefer Devarim. You know, and Aaron's dead by then. It's not Aaron speaking for him. This is Moshe speaking. So, he does somehow figure out how to do it. But, um... But in uh, in terms of um, in, in terms of this, and in terms of what we're saying here, judges can have a mum. Judge on the Sanhedrin cannot have a mum. Is that a respect? Like nobody would respect the Sanhedrin, the judge in Sanhedrin. Well, I think that goes back to the argument that we didn't like. Yeah. Argument number one: they won't respect the base of Mikdash. It's for the Sanhedrin, for the base of Mikdash, I'm much more offended because it's the base of Mikdash. It's like the place that you're serving Hashem. Yeah. I don't know, I feel like it's way worse. I think it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 um, the, not just that though, a king is possible as well. If the king has a mum, the king is disqualified too. Does it? Take a look at number 15. Yeah, that I like. Look at number 15. The Gemara says, You don't appoint someone to a position of leadership unless he has literally a box of creepy crawly creatures, um, yeah, lizards, whatever, um, hanging behind him. So that if he becomes arrogant, we say, look behind you. Skeletons in the closet. That's the image. Exactly. We want them to have something that's going to keep them humble. So then, why is it that, again, we're disqualifying the king who has a I don't think that king should be humble. I think that that would go contrary to the other qualities of a king that you want. Mm-hmm. Someone who's courageous and, and like, a little bit, you want that arrogance to like go out there and conquer nations. You don't want to help them. Yeah, because yeah, that works really well for us. Yeah. Yes. No, everyone needs to be humble. Yeah. 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 Right. The um, the yes. I, by the way, if anyone wanted to look it up, um, perhaps someone on the recording wanted to look it up. The one who says that being mute will disqualify is Shevet Halevi. 
Chelek, Ches, Reish, and Aleph. Okay. In any case, the um, the the um, I have it in my notes. I didn't memorize it. Wow. <laughs> I hit it in the notes. <laughs> the uh, no, it's in my notes. The um, so I think that that a way to look at it is this: those who are excluded are not representatives of us. The ones who are excluded are representatives of Hashem. The Gemara in Yuma and in Kiddushin discusses Kohanim as either Shluchei Didan or Shluchei Derachmana. Either they are our agents, bringing our gift to God, or they are God's agent coming to us. Think about Birchas Kohanim, right? They're not our representative. They're Hashem's representative to, to us. And I brought you source number 16 from Malachi when he gives the Kohanim his lecture. He says, He says, You want to know who you're supposed to be? The lips of the Kohen are supposed to guard Dat. People are supposed to seek Torah from him. Because he is a Malach Hashem. The Kohen is not, a, is not supposed to be a representative of humanity. The Kohen is supposed to be a representative of Hashem. Ditto the Melech. The Melech is supposed to convey authority that comes from Hashem via the instructions of the Navi, the instructions of the Kohen Gadol and the Urim Betumim, the Sefer Torah that the, Kohen tra- that the king travels with at all times. Ditto the Sanhedrin. Hashem is described as being with the Sanhedrin when they judge. They are located, as noted, in the Beis Hamikdash. The Kohen, the king, the Sanhedrin can't have a mum because they represent God. They represent Hashem to us, and Hashem has no defect. Oh. That's, that to me is what's going on. Yeah. What about the internal moon then? The internal moon, again, is not visible to the people who are walking in. They don't see it. It's all about perception. Okay. The, you know, and, and I think this is interesting not only because it explains what's going on in the base Hamikdash, but because it also adds a lesson regarding how all of us are supposed to look at this. Meaning, there are two types of success in life, if I can speak very simplistically. Um, There is easy victory, and then there's triumph over adversity. For human beings, which one is greater, the easy victory or the triumph over over adversity? Triumph over adversity. Right? It's better if you have to work harder. So our role models, generally speaking, are human beings who have obstacles, who have challenges, and who overcome them. But that's what the king is not. The king represents Hashem, for whom there is neither obstacle nor struggle. It's meaningless, those terms, when you're talking about Hashem. There is no defect. And so the divine agent, like the master, has to represent success without challenge. But for us, the Kohen is not a role model. That's what it means. Don't look at the Kohen as the model for who you're supposed to be like. You know, we are incomplete. We are challenged in any number of ways. And our role models are, are challenged human beings. It will, it will be criminally foolish if we fail to value the role model who has triumphed over adversity and went looking for the Kohen in the base Hamikdash and said, and said, and said that's the one who, who we want. The, um, yeah, the, you know, the Moshe who deals with being Kvad Peh and yet is able to lead, that's the model that we want. The Kohen, the Kohen is from Hashem. That's the, that's, that's different. So the Kohen, we're, we're saying, doesn't have a, can't have a mom because really we should see the Kohen as being Hashem and Hashem doesn't have a mom? Hashem's agent, yes. But we, the Kohen and the Levian and everything they do is to serve Hashem. Like, it's so obvious. It's like everything. But this, this is a different view. It's not about serving Hashem. It's, it is serving Hashem in the same way that a Malach serves Hashem. But is he doing a mission on behalf of God? Not bringing something from human beings to God. Uh-huh. That's, uh, that, I don't know. It, it, it resonates with me. And, uh, it resonates with me. But now I need to think of all the Kohanim. Yeah, like, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Hashem is not present yeah. physically, so therefore there's a Kohen that's right. it. So it's like, 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 like,
it fits into a whole bunch of other things that the Kohen is actually Hashem's agent rather than uh, rather than ours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's Emor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.